Uh, welcome everyone. Sadly, this is our very last talk. Um, but today I'm going to focus on storytelling. I think when a lot of people see the UEA logo on past and footprints, they assume it's a uh, project coming out of the history department. And while our history colleagues have helped us out, um, I actually sit in the School of Literature, Drama and Creative Writing. Because what I'm interested in is how do people connect with the archives? How do people connect with the Paston story? So the Paston project, um, the Paston story over 600 years old, of course, it's been told in many formats beforehand. And we can divide the way in which the Paston story has been told into sort of two key broad areas up until past and footprints. Um, on your left, you see your typical academic kind of conference and audience. Um, and or the other images are kind of synopsis of the way in which uh, the community has told the Paston story, most specifically the Paston Heritage Society, which was set up over 20 years ago by Lucy Kerr and has had multiple members over the years who have been very engaged in reenactment, in poetry readings, um, community archaeology, exhibitions, publications, and local talks. Very importantly, this is the spine of our project. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. We keep with these traditional storytelling methods because it's what heritage lovers and what communities connect with. It's proven and tested and it works. And as Past and Footprints, we've been doing a whole range of these kinds of activities, building on that legacy. The academic side of things um, has also seen a great interest in the actual archives, and in the buildings and in archaeology, in heraldry. Um, from the point of the letters, scholarship has really focused on the kind of critical reception of the Pastons. Um, mm -hmm. Linguistic studies, exploring how different Pastons use different language, especially the medieval epistolary letter culture through to the humanism elements that we get in the Tudor and Stuart periods. There has also been an interest in the kind of historical data we can glean from the letters. What we've done on the This Is Paston website is create a bibliography of all known publications by everybody that we know of uh, in, in the history of Paston reception. That's on the This Is Paston website. It can be found under the letters tab ingeniously under the subheading bibliography. Now it has been created by myself and I'm a literary scholar, so I'm pretty sure I've missed some entries out and this is just a call to action. If you know of any other publications not there on the site, let us know and we'll add them. And uh, we hope this will become the central portal for academics, community members, heritage professionals, creative practitioners to come to, to find out what else has been told and done on the past tense. Now, one other little footnote before I get into the presentation today is that I do want to sketch a little bit about the theoretical influence on my interest in this project and be, because it really speaks to the heart of what I mean by we're going on a journey today in today's talk about storytelling. Um, it's so interesting that um, whenever students apply to the university, they always say, I'm passionate about the Middle Ages. It's never I'm interested, I like. They, they really have to emphasize how passionate they are. Now, they're probably desperate to get into uni and they therefore use hyperbole, but there is something about this idea about passion about the Middle Ages. And there's been this theoretical school developed simply called medievalism. And you can extend that to say early modernism to cover the Tudor and Stuart periods as well. Medievalism is nothing more complex than how do modern audiences interact with early heritage um, from the Middle Ages? How do they interact with the letters, the landscapes, and the landmarks? Do they attempt to uh, imitate them, um, reconstruct them? Um, do they attempt to develop them and fill, perhaps fill in gaps and, 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 and use the context to kind of sort of see where it goes? Um, do they attempt to usurp them, recreate them in modern images, 
Or is there some kind of reform using the as synthesis of the old and new together? So that's notions of development, imitation, um, that kind of notion of authentic history through to um, reform and where the old and the new have dialogues together. And I think most of us today would recognize that re reformation model of how the old speaks to the new and how the new speaks to the old. But medievalism is the body of post-medieval recreations, the kind of novels, films, artworks, and so on, that have profoundly influenced how we emotionally react to the period. One small example, well-known example, is the English poem Beowulf, once consigned to the very small seminar group studying the chores of old English. Now the poem is a fast seen by many as a fascinating assemblage of text and cinematic image, not least because of the poet laureate Seamus Heaney's interest in modern translation of it, but also the film version with the A-list Hollywood cast and their director, Robert C. Meckes, working at the kind of bleeding edge of cinematic technology. This sort of presence of medievalism as a range of cultural phenomenon from Beowulf to computer games to Game of Thrones is a major way in which heritage is preserved and continued. But so too is the spread of medievalism as a leisure pursuit, either in DIY forms like reenactment and dramas, but also in the more organized form of tourism. Um, just, speak, just speak to visit Norfolk or any of those tourist bodies and how much they want to promote their medieval quarters in the cities. Our project takes part in these medievalism stances with that kind of sense of animations, dramas, 3D impressions, new data visualizations, speaking with the language of today but also linking with experiential tourism. One of our partners is Norfolk County Council. And we're adding in, as we heard last week, very much the kind of well-being pursuit with cultural history that is newly emerging. But how did we get to this stage of multiple storytelling methods when in popular culture through to today, whatever it takes the medievalists most is when they hear the period being described as the dark ages. It's generally some kind of objection and application that's kind of going on that's kind of bound up with the emotional responses to the pre-modern past. Medieval, primitive, postmodern, much more advanced. How might we recover the emotional history of these responses? Um, we can't easily perform a sociology of past and attitudes. Um, should we therefore carry out an attempt to recognize all the symptoms of emotions or the current fashionable mode of the cultural history. Is that more productive? What do I mean by that? Basically, what, how do we feel about the past? How do we feel about the past? That's at the heart of today. Um, so it's not about past and emotions and politics, but in feelings about those emotions and politics. That's enough of a preamble. Um, I'm going to move on now and um, kind of explore this notion of touching past and lives. There are going to be three key strands today. We're going to look at new storytellers, kind of democratizing access to the, to the past and heritage, the emotional resonance and connection with today, but also creativity, engaging, how do we engage with experiences of otherness in the past and material? Um, one of the key ways to do that is through uh, understanding where we've come from. So there's an image of where the bibliography is on the This Is Past and Portal that I previously mentioned. But another way is through this sense of um, creating different story strands for different audiences. So um, we've been very keen to create uh, uh, and engage with our predominant audience, heritage lovers. We would classify all of you guys turning up today to the NRO as heritage lovers. Um, you're interested, you've got uh, maybe some background and context in exploring the past, whether it's the past and or not. And the traditional storytelling methods that we've outlined is very much a key part of that. You will notice down at the bottom of your screen 
that um, we have got our brand logo there on the, uh, the trefoil um, using the heraldic symbol of the pastons and using the heraldic colours. For anyone who uh, understands the Pastons, this is something that's familiar, a heraldry symbol. This is saying this is the brand of the Pastons. But as our project developed, we felt we needed another logo for our project because we were reaching out access to children and young audiences. Um, we also wanted to pick up something that represented the otherness of the Middle Ages and Tudor and Stuart periods, but also seemed familiar. And so it very obviously seemed to us to be the Griffin as the ideal um, kind of format to use when we're reaching out to those other audiences. So that's very much um, something just thinking about how you brand your heritage story. Perhaps you need different guidelines and different access points in for different audiences. Now, that's not to say we can't bring new light to um, either side. So for the Griffin, it's really interesting. Um, it's often... Uh, in any sort of side note about the Paston's heraldic symbol, it's noted that um, because the griffin's hybrid shape is that of an eagle, you notice its head, neck, wings and talons are conjoined to the legs and back body of a lion. That means the symbol that they've chosen to represent the Paston family denotes strength, military courage and leadership. This is because the lion is the king of the beasts, while the eagle is the king of the birds. So while we use the griffin, and indeed that's a modern um, interpretation drawing of the griffin by um, Penny Nee, who is head of the Norfolk Heraldry Society, and she's used the kind of correct posture and stance and so on. So somebody with a heraldic background, a heritage lover, will understand um, the representation of the griffin. But of course, younger audiences, particularly the demographic that are aware of Harry Potter and material like that, will recognize it as a symbol as well. We'll recognize this is one of those kind of um, medieval imaginings of an ancient symbolic mythical creature, just like the Sphinx um, or the dragon. And they'll recognize it because it's been a symbol used in common language today and in common uh, popular media as, as a way back into the Middle Ages. But there's something else that we can do with this heraldic symbol that we can translate into coloring in sheets. At the minute this week, we're running Name the Griffin competition for kids. Um, and what's quite interesting about that is that um, the submissions that we've had, some of them have been historically informed. So clearly parents who are interested in the heritage are doing quite a lot of thinking and exploration about it. Um, Self-fashioning I've put down as an example of the names we've had submitted, i.e. people want to name the past and Griffin after themselves, and why not? There's some quite affectionate names coming forward, quite cute names, but there's also interesting sounding ones, ones that are onomatopoeic as well. Um, which is really quite fascinating. But the, um, the sort of sense of the way in which we're trying to draw these audiences together is that with the very image of the griffin, we can do two things. We can add to the historical understanding and awareness by drawing a fact, drawing attention to the fact that the griffin was reported to be fiercely protective of its young. And some reports suggest that the Griffins guarded gold as well as their young children. That the Paston family, with its redoubtable clan of matriarchs and female warriors, have this female mythical beast as its badge of identity is highly appropriate. Let's unsilence the gender of the Griffin. The Griffin is female, just as we have a project to unsilence the voices of the Paston women. Thinking about how you market and brand your heritage is really important because it, it's that point of access in and it's the immediate thing that allows people to think of how to relate to this otherness of the past, either through love of heritage or love of the kind of Griffin image. So um, that's led us on to thinking um, very carefully in our project about how do we represent the vast amount of historical knowledge to different audiences. And clearly, um, creating meaningful finding aids is very, very important. 
um, to, as part of our project. And therefore, um, we've created a range of different ways to visualize the data about the family. Perhaps the most obvious starting point is the family tree. Um, the, there's um, a, a move to try and create more finding aids for people to help orientate themselves. And there's interesting ways to do this. On this is Paston website, there is an amazing interactive family tree. So you can click on that side where you see the little square boxes. Um, you can click and you can see John Paston the first there is highlighted in red. That's because that's the one we're looking at, who's he's married to, who are his parents, who are the children. And you can explore the whole family tree in this way. And it allows you to visualize the family tree, understand the connections and orientate yourself. Now, expert professionals uh, um, really value this sense of creating finding aids to create orientation for those who are coming to the information new. But what if you put it on a public exhibition? Um, you kind of want to make a family tree interesting because quite frankly, unless it's your own family tree or that of a group of people that you're really interested in, your eyes can kind of gloss over it. In the exhibition at the NRO, you can see that we translated this into a slightly different image where we have our little animated characters and little love hearts to show the marriage. And again, kind of picking up a clue from some of the visual data, data visualization that takes place in Harry Potter um, films, we created a family tree such as this. Um, if we were doing a purely historical orientated audience, um, you might want to use the kind of family trees that you might have seen in the Berlin's family um, TV series, which implies that it's being done in all documents and such like. So thinking how you even present your information is a form of storytelling. Do you want people to engage with it and be curious? Do you want people to actually interact with it? Do you want people just to get an overall sense or go into depth? Um, so that's one of the things in creating basic um, historical aids. On the This Is Paston website, there are numerous finding and orientation aids that have been created to Paston places, to Paston people, um, to Paston objects, uh, also to the buildings and landscapes, but even something as simple as a timeline. How do you create that and how do you tell a story out of a timeline? Again, a useful orientation aid, but it just depends on who's creating the timeline. What kind of context do you give? Do you give political context, social? Do you give literary context? Um, and therefore, that timeline is just a starting point for people to kind of explore in context in greater detail. However, that was us creating the family trees. What if we democratize access and allow other people to create their versions of family trees? It was quite interesting because we approached a group of young 20 year old somethings and this is the way they presented the family tree information. They quite literally took the idea of a tree and they created it um, in the kind of modern lingo of a word cloud. But you'll see that they put in not just the figures, they put in like notable places like Caster Castle, keywords like human nature, family conflicts, love. Um, they wanted to put a little bit of a context around it. Now, there are a few errors in this um, image, but the point is, this is the way they wanted to tell the story. And of course, an image speaks um, a thousand words. So as much as you might want to storytell in your own project, hand it over to other people and see how do they want to present the same data and the same information. You can get really interesting results. So um, we want to find meaningful, that, that, that kind of outlines that sort of sense of thinking about different audiences and who you're doing the storytelling and for what purpose and intent. But what about linking to today's culture and today's emotions? So there, as we see, love is written down there, um, visionaries and um, parents and children. Of course, family life still exists today as it did in the past. Days. And that means warts and all. So there's some controversial information in the Paston letters, like, for instance, Agnes Paston's abuse of her daughter, Elizabeth Paston, and uh, domestic violence. Um, what do you do with details like that? Do you share? Do you frame it in some kind of way? What we felt when we were talking to a general 
audience, the general public on something like social media is that we need to use the modern parlance of trigger warnings if we were dealing with um, potentially distressing content. And that's where you're mixing our modern language, recognizing we've got different moral compasses today, um, but recognizing it's still a, still a part of human behavior today and letting people be aware of that. There's also other elements in the letters. Um, is that there is a big ethical issue. These are family letters that we're dealing with so many hundreds of years later. later. There's a lot of research going into the ethics of studying historical accounts. And there are a few elements that we've chosen not to narrate. Um, but equally, there have been other elements where we felt, actually, it's quite important that we start addressing what's been silenced and actually allowing people to interact in different ways. And this is perhaps uh, most obvious with um, the past and treasure painting. Now, Francesca Vank gave a superb talk earlier in this series um, on the past and treasure painting, building out of the Norwich Castle Museum's magnificent 2018 exhibition. This painting, and, and refer to Francesca's work and the, and the castle blogs for more details about the painting. What I want to draw attention to today is that this painting um, created um, as a result to celebrate the wealth that the Passons had cum accumulated and their foreign travels um, while they were um, in residence at Oxnead Hall. This is a sign of wealth and accumulation. But there are two people in the painting. And um, Francesca's done magnificent work to help identify who the little girl is, Margaret Paston. But what about the figure at the edge of the painting, um, the, youth, the youthful boy? He is someone who doesn't appear in the past in letters. There's no record of him. Um, do we use the style of the painting to try and understand who this is? It is a painting of object arts, it, that sort of sense of accumulation. Um, might this be a hint that the Pastons had a servant because it was common at this time that that could be a possibility, particularly perhaps in their London house? Is it, however, different because there are two types of illustration being drawn together in this painting where you have portraiture as well as objects. And actually that's not typical of the kind of object image um, with the youthful boy. It's actually quite a clear portrait. And therefore, um, what's going on with this painting? This voice has been quite silenced um, until recently. Um, that kind of sense of what should we do with this culture and period that did employ um, Africans as slaves. What do we do about that? Do we acknowledge it in any way? So our project decided to start probing this. And um, on This Is Paston, there is this amazing data visualization aid um, where you see the painting, but then you can hover over it and get details of any of the objects that are then exemplified and magnified as you can see in the smaller image here. We do address um, the youthful boy, but we point out the different arguments of, of who that could be. Is it someone on their visits? Is it a servant? Um, what, what, what's the point of it? So rather than it being a museum catalogue of objects, um, we actually include a little narrative in the slide um, or, or as you hover over it um, to involve people on a sense of discovery. Um, we can't say definitively who it is. But that led our project on to thinking, OK, is there something else that we have to do um, about widening access and democratizing access? And do we um, censor this detail out in our project? Do we address it? And one of the ways we thought we could handle it was to actually bring um, uh, the passing characters to life. So we've done quite a large number of dramas in this Past and Footprints project. This image still images off them at Mannington Hall. In this drama, we had um, this figure that you can see in the background distance. Um, and this person agreed to take on minor roles, not as a servant of the household, but as one of the Paston characters, one of the minor Paston characters. 
The reason we placed this figure in a minor role was we were playing mainly to a heritage loving audience that do like to strive for senses of authenticity, um, but also uh, to, to family, family groups that turned up for a festival day. And we wondered, would anybody make any remark about that's anachronistic? That, that, that person wouldn't be one of the Pastons, might be part of the Paston household, but not one of the Pastons. And happily, we're very pleased to say they accepted um, our hybrid culture that we live in today, and no one raised it as an anachronism. So that led us on to a play at Norwich Castle, where he became the main character. He always knew all along he was going to become the main character. And he became one of the main characters in this play that was uh, performed in the, in the Norwich Castle Museum. And as a result of that, he um, addressed, didn't just appear as someone of colour, but also addressed the issues of the historical period. And we looked at the Royal Philosophical Society, which the Paston, uh, was, uh, Pastons were founding members of, and looked at the very controversial um, language of servanthood and philosophical re uh, debates that they were having in their day, and put in and gave him the voice to do that. And that provoked interest and curiosity in how different the past was compared to today by allowing him to become the central main voice piece of that. At this time, or actually uh, just last year, um, an opera singer, Peter Outhwaite, not part of our project, also responded to the past and treasure painting. Um, he, he worked on actually 80 different black portraitures um, during lockdown, that's what kept him busy. Um, Peter's remarkable recreations have made a huge impression and got people talking about um, in Black Lives Matters, about the Pastons, just people that would never have engaged with this heritage before. Um, it's called The Boy with the Monkey on His Back. Peter casts himself um, in the role of the anonymous boy who appears um, on the left of the extravagant 17th century oil painting, The Paston Treasure. While much scholarly attention has been paid to its technicalities, the painting, um, never before has there been very much said about the black figure who simultaneously seems both to command the scene and exist on its margins. Peter himself has said, when I cre recreated this painting, this sideline figure had to be center stage. That's the point of my project after all, bringing marginalized black figures of art history into the foreground. So I cast myself in the boy's role. Stepping into the anonymous black man's shoes would bring his reality and his truth into the picture, creating a scene where his culture could shine. Note all the different, ob note the Afro um, is exemplified, note all the different kinds of um, objects that this boy owns rather than what the Pastons own. Um, creating a scene where his culture could shine, amaze and be treasured. And there's some fascinating reviews that go into depth about how this is creating a voice. But a free black man now joining his own history and personhood to the historical boys through the reworking disrupts the naturalization of the history of servanthood, disrupts the, uh, the image in the scene. So this is, a, this is a moment of real reform. So you can unsilence the voices. And we felt so inspired by this, we felt, but there are other past and voices that need to be unsilenced. And that's the voices of the women. So um, I'm going to move on to um, two key figures in the remainder of my talk, Marjorie Paston, and I'm also going to look at it from the medieval period, and then I'm going to look at Edward Paston from later on as a way to explore the storytelling methods that we've used. Now, we first of all called it a rebel women campaign because they are rebellious daughters, they're rebellious wives, um, they're rebellious against social norms, um, the education, the resilience, the courage of the Paston women is such a cornerstone of the Paston story. And yet, Apart from Agnes Paston, we did polls on, on as surveys. Apart from Agnes Paston and Margaret Paston, very few, uh, arguably Marjorie Bruce Paston as well as the author of the earliest Valentine letter, very few of the other Paston women are known, not just in the public, but even within academic circles, and particularly the Paston women of the 16th and 17th centuries. 
on our Twitter account at Past and Footprint. If you go back in its history, you can see how we drew out extracts of the Paston letters, um, what the Paston women are actually saying. Um, and we ran a big social media campaign. You can see our drama director, Holly Maples, on the other side of the screen there, with her hand at the front of the screen. This was because we took part in International Women's Day, which was all about unsilencing the voices. And that was a way to tie into contemporary culture about trying to rescue silenced voices. Um, they're not silenced, they're there in the archives, they're just waiting to be told. Um, they haven't had as much limelight as uh, some of the other figures, with the exceptions perhaps of Ag Agnes, Margaret and Marjorie. So um, we turn to our public facing website rather than the Heritage Lovers website, which is This Is Paston, um, which goes deep into the story. And we felt um, our walks website was the place to place um, the very first pages dedicated to the past and women, um, and this is just one next one, one the first line of it. Um, we have about um, 15 women there at the minute or so, and there are going to be more added. Um, and for many of them, it's the very first time that they've had a dedicated web page to themselves. So this is talking about things that people today are interested in. They're interested in feisty historical characters um, and, and how do they come about. Now, while we were keen to draw out extracts from the actual letters themselves and to show the historical record of the woman, we also turned to the young people again. Um, and I'm not being discriminatory. Um, people of any age can take part in this. It's an ongoing project. But we said to them, how do you imagine the lives of the past and women? How do you, um, in, uh, in when we provided kind of um, seminar sessions on, on the women, we said to a group of drama students, okay, how do you want to tell the past and women's story? And we gave them free reign. Quite a number of them did YouTube videos um, that kind of atmospheric look of that single figure staring straight at you. And some of them did amazing performances. These can be seen on the past and footprints .co.uk website. But in addition to that, um, we had some uh, group of them join together and create an escape room online for the tale of Elizabeth Paston, because of, of course Elizabeth is held um, against her will in the desire that she'll marry who the family want her to marry, but she ends up marrying for love herself. So rather than you know, using the words of the past in women rather than using the sort of uh, the ways in which um, we know the politics of the day. What they focused in was the emotions that must have been part of this story of Elizabeth Paston. And they created an escape room where they could go and listen to the brothers John Paston or um, uh, the mother or escape and run into Scrope that she's meant to marry or, or end up running and finding the man that she loves. The young people were interested in what was it like to live the lives of the pastors? How would they have felt? And they created this escape room, which you can play on YouTube. It's quite addictive because you've got, you have to make your decisions throughout. Um, so using modern technology as a way to tell the story of the pastors. We also had the uh, History Hunters and the Youth Heritage uh, Collective Movement from the Millennium Library in Norwich um, take part in Rosie's Plaques campaign, which is that traditional blue plaque campaign to celebrate historical figures. Only 80% of them in Norwich um, are focused on men, whereas only 20% are focused on women. So Rosie's Plaques joined with our young people and the young people chose the words and the adjectives and the descriptions for six of the past and women to make blue plaques in this alternative, slightly skewed fashion to show it's not official history. We are trying to uh, be radical and give these women a voice as well. And this is one of the key tips. This is democratizing access to the past and heritage. You're using um, audiences that are not gonna turn up to a market hall or church hall to listen to a talk, um, who aren't gonna spend ages work working through a website, but who want to unsilence the voices and want to share the celebration of the past and lives in these kinds of ways. So on the Past and Footprints website, you can consult these um, 
uh, features by exploring the pastons and you'll get the option of meet the family. And there's a, there's a gallery of the Paston women that we've done so far. We've dedicated a web page to each. Now, I mentioned that I was going to focus in on Marjorie Paston. Note this is um, not Marjorie Bruce Paston who marries into the family and creates the Valentine's letter, but is indeed of this generation. We've come up with a tagline for each of our Paston women. And um, we, we have deliberately chosen reenactors um, and a mixture of historical artifacts, such as Lady Catherine gets a tomb as her image, um, to show that we're trying to bring the past and present together in our gallery of past and women. But at this point, I'm going to um, divert and just read you out the biography on this webpage of Marjorie Paston. We opened it up to the public and said, who out there would like to write biographies? And this one um, is by Michelle Schindler, who is an author and a historian. Um, she's an, a historical novelist based in Germany. And she chose Marjorie Paston precisely because there are no letters. Um, that, that, that survived from Marjorie Paston. This is the Paston who marries the, the bailiff, um, Richard Call, and marries Down, which is frowned upon by the Paston family. So she is known because of that act. We have the mail letters, um, uh, Paston's and, and her mother writing, and we see the record of that. And she, you know, um, but the question is, how do you create a biography if you haven't got access to the woman's voice? And Michelle reflects on that. So listen to how she imagines the situation for Marjorie Paston in this short biography I'm going to read out. Um, listen to the way in which she crafts the life story coming across. And very importantly, notice she does not begin by saying who Marjorie Paston is married to, who she is the daughter of, because um, that's the traditional way to write, put, put in gene genealogical terms who this person is. But instead of understanding the women as daughters and as wives, how do we understand them as an actual voice in themselves? So um, bear with me for a couple of minutes as I read out this biography by um, Michelle Schindler on Marjorie Paston. Marjorie Paston's name is associated with scandal. This is not because she committed any crime or did anything wrong. It is simply because she went against her family's wishes and married a man her mother and brother did not want her to marry. A man called Richard Carl, the family's bailiff, sneerily described by Marjorie's brother, John Paston, as offering her nothing but a future of selling candles and mustard. Though Marjorie's decision to marry against her family's wishes has often been spoken about and in itself shows something of her character, it is nonetheless sadly notable that the bulk of interest about this marriage has been about her relative's reaction and not about her. What is actually known about Marjorie is not all that much, though bits and pieces can be put together from mentions in her family's letters. Born in 1448 to Margaret and John Paston, she has five brothers and one sister, Anne. She and Anne were therefore outnumbered, but we do not know how this influenced her. Extremely little is known about her childhood, her upbringing and education. But since we know that her mother, Margaret, was a literate and highly educated woman, there is no reason to assume she and Anne would have received a lesser education than any of her brothers, or not been aware of their own worth, considering themselves as lesser. Whatever Marjorie's education and upbringing was like, we do know that she grew up to be self-confident and have a mind of her own, which would then come um, to show as she grew up. At some point after 1466, probably early January 1467, when Marjorie was approximately 18 years old, her oldest brother, considered the head of the family, received a marriage proposal for her by John Strange, offering his nephew as her husband. How her brother reacted to this is not recorded, but Marjorie had different ideas, clearly not impressed by the 40% jointure and the 200 marks by inheritance she was offered. She made a rather unconventional decision she was going to choose her own marriage. 
and so on and so forth. There's much more to this biography, but I hope you'll see that it's that sense of what would have been like to grow up. Just because we don't have the records, we do understand the context. We can piece it together. Let's try and create a life for this figure. Um, as I say, you can see these different um, uh, details on the Past and Footprints website. But what we've also done is we've opened it up to other people who find it that there are other ways to record um, the past and women's lives. And on each past and page, there's an opportunity for you to create your own response to the story that you can find out about the relevant past and women um, that you're exploring. So it could be that you do poetry. It could be that you do a line drawing. It could be that you take a photograph of something um, or indeed create a digital animation if you have those skills. Um, we have this gallery, this creative gallery for every single woman in the past in history um, that we've done so far. And we, we do intend to do more. So um, please do take part if you feel inspired to explore their lives a little bit more and offer your version of the 21st century reaction to the past in women. So let's contrast this with a later figure um, in the 16th, 17th century. Sir Edward Paston, quite obviously he's male, not female. There's actually quite an interesting range of archival evidence about him, um, different forms of archives, um, as well as a tomb and different things like that. So there's much more historical evidence associated with Sir Edward Paston. And yet, he's really not known. Um, there's, there's very little known about him in the public domain, um, apart from some local history work. And even by academics, there's a couple of PhD theses out there, very interesting on his um, language and on, uh, on his linguistic skills, but also on his um, music, but really not that well known. I've put out, it's not very clear to see, I've put the family tree up to give you a sense of where Edward Paston is coming in the line. You can see him right down in the bottom um, corner, um, wearing the little hat and playing the lute. Um, he's um, on the line that goes right down to the Beddingfield, uh, the Beddingfields who marry into the Pastons and continue the line to today. Um, but he's um, several generations away from John and Margaret Paston and right from Clement and Beatrice at the start. Um, so what do we know about Edward Paston and how can we get modern audiences to engage with an unknown historical figure? Well, just briefly, um, Edward Paston was the second son of Sir Thomas Paston and the builder of Barningham Hall. Barningham Hall is the one surviving Paston building standing um, intact that you can really see, as Peter Sibbins mentioned last week. Edward Paston established the branch, of the, the branch of the family that would live there. He married Margaret Burney and they had nine children, all of whom can be seen on his memorial, a rather splendid memorial at Blowfield Church. Um, and we can actually identify his nine children, their name, or eight of the children in the names and some of their lives. Um, some of them went on to become, um, joined the Order of St. Benedict in Brussels as nuns. Um, some moved further afield to Gloucestershire and different places like that. He was a Roman Catholic recusant at a time when this was far from easy in Protestant England. He remodeled Thorpe Hall and built a hall at Appleton in West Norfolk. That key line, he was a Roman Catholic in a Protestant society. How do we deal with religious persecution? How do we comment on that and tell that as part of the past in story? Um, do, is that something that people will connect with today or not? Um, are there other ways to see, because that's the dominant, what we would call the dominant, the macro historical narrative of the age. So is that the narrative that we should pick up and really celebrate and explore in relation to Sir Edward Paston? Well, we thought that perhaps to make it seem relevant to today, to sort of explore that sort of sense of 
if you don't know the historical background, how can you find this interesting? Because for some people, discussions of religious um, persecution, especially between Catholics and Protestants, may seem a little controversial um, and a bit too close to home, says I from Northern Ireland. But also religious persecution is such a global narrative today in our society. And we thought, is there a way to talk about this, but to put it in historical context? And in the exhibition at the NRO, which is just there for a couple more days, um, we thought, well, actually, what Edward Paston is doing fits into the wider family narrative about the need for privacy. We are democratizing access to these letters. We're bringing them to attention. But in their day, they were actually really private documents. And uh, the seals, the tradition of the sealing the letter so that people couldn't read it when it was in transit, um, the M Ploring voices that we hear, I pray you burn this letter, um, showing that feature of, do you know what, this politics or gossip in this letter that could do our family harm. Um, clearly, they weren't burnt. Um, but there's also that desire to not let people understand what's going on in these letters. Um, and an actual Paston cipher is created in the 17th century by Robert and Rebecca Paston as a way to kind of write in code. Well, Edward Paston did the same because he was a Roman Catholic living in a Protestant culture. And maybe that's the way into the story um, that's perhaps most interesting. Um, Edward was a skilled lute player and very much an important music collector. And he uh, collected the works of Byrd and Talis, um, educated in being in Roman Catholic country, and he actually embeds secret codes into, he used song compositions as an opportunity to employ subtle reference to Catholic ideas. And um, you can work that out from the lyrics that he creates and such likes. So that's one of the ways we access this form of history. We also created, um, Peter Stibbins, um, Craig Smith, and a whole team of people created animations Initially, these were designed to tell the stories of the Pastons to school children and young children generally. Um, all children enjoy a little cartoon, a little kind of animation. But we find out that adults are kids at heart as well. And increasingly, more and more adults have enjoyed this as a three to five minute way in to finding out about these Paston characters. And very importantly, contemporary uh, relevant historical music acts as a soundtrack. You find out the historical details, but it's told through the character of the figure of the day. So that's another way to popularize this story and to get it out there. The animations have been highly successful. But another key way is thinking about um, going to the actual place where Edward Paston lived. Um, and we have one of our heritage walks is the Blowfield Heritage Walk. And musical memories feature on this peaceful 1.5 mile walk, which includes a healing herb garden. And that's quite important. Um, on our walks um, designed for different audiences, we do try to use the senses a lot. And um, sensory storytelling um, is understood today to relate to people learn in different ways. So on these walks, we do have um, some of Burden Tulsa's music. We do have some of the music that Edward Paston would have been listening to playing as you go on these walks, if you listen to the free audio podcasts. Um, uh, as, as, as for moments for contemplation and relaxation as you're walking, and then as background to some of the story when there are voiceovers. However, music in heritage projects is very, very uh, controversial. Um, what music do you pick? Do you pick ones that are historically informed like that? Or do you pick atmospheric music? So at the minute we're creating a trailer for our walks for well-being, people who want to engage in connecting with culture and history for well-being purposes, as Rob Nee outlined last week. We've chosen relaxing music, um, music that will play and is psychologically researched to activate different kinds of emotions as our trailers rather than the historic because we're tailoring it for a different kind of audience. But music in film um, has been studied quite well in, in different kinds of medieval and Tudor films, but less so um, in other mediums like video games, like some of our young people put in those YouTube and computer video games that we saw earlier. 
um, there's one critic, Helen Demian, who says, um, the employment of music within any kind of heritage production um, reveals less about the time and the period and more about contemporary notions of the medieval and what emotional connotations are embedded within such musical choices. Um, there are ubiquitous medievalist musical tropes, the Gothic organ, the church bell, the wordless voice, to create a sense of opposite emotional states, a sense of peace, tranquility, or sanctuary on the one hand, like you hear in the bells on the 3D impression of Bromholm Priory in our project, and danger and violence, like the drums that you hear and the sounds of crossbows that you hear on the Margaret Maltby Paston walk. Um, the supernatural and the death on some hands, connecting these emotional musical stereotypes to the medieval era itself. So every sense is important when you're telling a historical narrative, you're trying to think of um, why are you creating that as a background sound? What is the emotional resonance that modern audiences can have today? But there's other ways to access um, the, the story of an unknown historical figure. Um, and it can be getting people to participate in the storytelling. What do they think of Blowfield um, and, the, and the walk? And we run a photography competition where there are amazing prizes if you go on any of our heritage walks. Um, that's a form of recording what speaks to you today? Are you taking pictures of the buildings? Are you taking pictures of the landscape? Um, are you taking curious ones and doctoring them with different light effects and such likes? Are you taking them in the moment because you're a family on the hoof? Um, that tells us who our audiences are. It tells us um, how you're connecting. Um, we have, of course, the animations, we have the historical detail, and we link always through on our walks website through to This Is Past and to allow people to go deeper. But we also are billing some of these walks as well-being walks, as I've mentioned about the senses. Um, and we incorporate today's modern language as a way to access the heritage. So if you're inside the church, you see the magnificent tomb, you can see there in the second image of Edward Paston and, his, and all his children. Um, we include grounding techniques, asking people, what do they see? What do they hear? What do they touch? Um, what does it feel like? Encouraging people to not just listen to a story, but to narrate their experience of walking in the footprints of the Pastons. Of course, there's the magnificent herb garden that's just been created at Blowfield Church as well. And they provide historical narrative about what the different remedies and potions were. Um, and of course, it's incredibly sensory um, with the smell. Um, that will help people remember this experience of finding out about the Pastons. Throughout the rest of the walk, some selected images and highlights there, you can see on the screen, um, we use different um, techniques such as enrolling you into members of being the past and household, what about you having an active engagement on the walk, um, through to the range of different methods that Rob was talking about in the speech, uh, in the talk last week, but very much that sense of um, how do you use your well-being? How do you connect to nature? How do you see this as a soundscape walk? Um, use today's environment as a filter for understanding how you're walking in the footprints of the pastons. There's many other there's many other forms of storytelling in this project. Um, I would refer you to Peter Stibbins and James Mindham's talk on the digital, um, what turned out to be initially digital reconstructions, but have turned into impressions, um, artistic ones using the voices from the letters, um, using um, artistic interpretation of texture and stuff. There's lots of different forms of storytelling going on in this project. Um, which we hope you will enjoy. And um, to that end, I will highlight the two major resources that we have um, for you to continue to explore the past and heritage beyond these talks and beyond the exhibition at the NRO. This is paston.co.uk is for heritage lovers. It's detailed, there's magnificent narratives, there's magnificent images, there's great detail. Um, a range of different people have come together to create this. And we're always looking for more people. Um, we want this to be the past and portal, um, particularly for communities and heritage researchers to explore the pastons. 
But also, in addition to that, we have the website that's designed for those people who only have maybe two to 15 minutes maximum time to explore what do they want to do? How do they want to experience the past and heritage? And as a result, we created the Walks website, which also has those creative galleries, pastandfootprints.co.uk. And that, that's will give you um, access to um, eventually eight heritage walks, two cycle rides, as well as the kind of creative ways that people are interpreting the pastons today. Those are our two major lasting outputs um, from the Past and Footprints project. We do also have social media channels um, where you'll continually to see updates um, on the project. The HOF funding is coming to an end this year, but this is only the beginning for Past and Footprints. We've already got new ideas for next year and we're always looking for more and more people to join the team. Thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed this journey and exploration of um, a kind of sense of what uh, storytelling methods take place in the past and heritage, some of our challenges we've encountered, and also some of the ways that we find to respond. Thank you.